We're thrilled to welcome D.A. Wallach and Tim Bright, co-founders of Time BioVentures, to the show today. Thank you once again for joining us. To help co-host this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Chris Godvon. Let's kick things off. D.A., can you start? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm D.A. Wallach. As you mentioned, Tim and I are partners in our firm, Time BioVentures, and I've had a very a typical path into biotech venture investing. Began my career as a professional rock musician. I had a band that I started in college that had some success after uh, Kanye West discovered us when um, we were 21. And I moved out to Los Angeles, spent a few years making records and touring with everyone from Weezer to Lady Gaga. And um, then about a decade ago, made my first venture investment, which was Spotify. And that pivoted me from the world of music into the world of venture capital. And through a few years of investing across a range of different types of companies, I ended up discovering that I was fascinated by problems that um, needed to be solved in healthcare and the life sciences. And so for about the past six years, I've been investing pretty much exclusively in the spaces that we uh, focus on as a firm. And Tim and I teamed up about a year and a half ago to build our organization and start investing together. Fantastic. Thanks once again for joining us, DA. Tim, can you share an intro as well? Sure, Chaz. So I, I grew up in a rural setting just outside Wilmington, Delaware. Two years into my biology undergrad degree at the University of Delaware, I had the opportunity to apply for early admission to the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and was chosen to join a class of about 30 students into what was, in what was called the 2 plus 5 program at that time. I've always been open to following different forks in the road, new opportunities through my life. And this has led me to many interesting career changes from what my original plan was, which was to practice medicine in a rural setting. I ended up taking an academic path, had an exciting time there for over a decade, and then moved to the pharmaceutical R&D area and uh, pursued that for over a decade. And after that, moved to biotech for several years, and, and now I've found myself teaming up with DA and pursuing venture investing. It's, it's been a fantastic transition across many different career opportunities. And I'm look, really looking forward to the next phase, uh, which is having greater impact on the future of innovation in life sciences. Thanks once again for joining us, Tim. One fun question we love to ask our guests comes from Dennis Gabor, electrical engineer and recipient of the 1971 Nobel Prize in Physics. He says the future cannot be predicted, but the future can be invented. Can you share with us at Time BioVentures, what does inventing the future mean to you? Over a decade ago, I was part of a, a team that was looking at what the future might hold for pharma development uh, while I was at Novartis. One of the things that, that came up during that team effort was the discovery of a phrase that was out there that's attributed to William Gibson and that the future has arrived. It's just not very evenly distributed, meaning that if you look around, you'll see glimpses of what the future holds in today's discoveries. And so I think for us, it's about getting an idea of what that future holds, surveying a large array of discoveries, inventions, early stage innovations across technology and life sciences. And inventing the future then, to me, means enabling or nurturing that spark of innovation that will lead to uh, major implementations in these innovations in the future and helping help them become a reality. It's really about taking ideas and transforming them to actions and products. Jumping into your path to VC, DA, your journey has involved an exploration from musician to startup advisor and investor, first in tech and now in biotech. And Tim, you began as a physician scientist before pivoting to and from academia and industry. So taking things a step back, DA, you mentioned you've made your first investment in Spotify. Can you tell us more about what led your transition from the stage to the boardroom and about your role as an artist in residence on Spotify? I came into the music industry as an artist at a very interesting moment in that industry's history because about 10 years before I got my first record deal, the iTunes store had opened. And with it, Apple, in a significant way, disrupted the way that music was sold or bought. Namely, people historically had always bought these albums, packages of 10 songs, 15 songs. You might remember in those days, you, you would have hear one song you loved on the radio, but you'd have to go spend 18 bucks to get the whole album just to be able to play it in your car. And what Apple had done through the iTunes store, and this followed on the early disruption of Napster and some of the other peer-to-peer -peer services, 
was unbundle music. And with that, the industry saw a massive decline in revenues because finally consumers could just buy the songs a la carte that they wanted to hear. And so when I came into the music business, it was a shadow of its former size, about one tenth of the annual revenues that it had previously generated. And everyone was trying to figure out how do we fix this thing? How do we get more money back into music? Because most consumers were spending a very small percentage of what they used to. And so when I found the Spotify team, it seemed to me that they had finally built a product that was so compelling that you could imagine people who basically had stopped paying for music starting to pay again. And it was such a simple value proposition that for $10 a month, you could have in your pocket the entire history of the world's recorded music that I felt it was worth basically putting my career on hold and trying to make this happen, trying to help make this happen. So it was amazing to be able to work with uh, that team as it was just preparing to come to the United States and some of the other major music markets in the world. And we had a wonderful journey. It was at the beginning an uphill battle. Essentially, we had to sell both the music industry and the consumer, and not to mention artists themselves, on the idea that this was a, a good direction for music consumption to move. So it, it was a fabulous experience. A similar question for yourself, Tim. What drove your transition from the hospital to industry to academia and ultimately back? Yeah, so it's interesting. From a very early age, I, I became fascinated with biology and in particular human biology and physiology. That led me to begin reading you know, around the age of 11, 12, as much as I could on the topic. Eventually, I volunteered as an orderly at a local emergency room. That only further stimulated my interest in medicine and I mention this because at the core of my motivation is, is a drive to help others uh, that I've had from an early age. And role models were physicians, nurses, healthcare professionals that really you know, had the patient uh, at heart. And so, you know, I mentioned previously in college, I, I took a path to an early acceptance to medical school and it was phenomenal. Within the first month of being in, in medical school, I, I did things that because of the program being set up this way, most medical students would do in their third or fourth year. I was scrubbing in at surgeries and meeting patients uh, with physicians and, and giving counseling to students with all supervision, of course. But it only further you know, instill in me this drive to apply my talents in a, in a patient-centric way. My career, as I mentioned previously, was initially, I was thinking about becoming a, a rural community physician. But along the way, I found that being a doctor uh, was just not enough to satisfy my scientific curiosity and did some research work during my training that led me down an academic path where I found I could conduct basic research, applied research, teach, and still see patients. And I found it very challenging and fulfilling for many years. What, what you find though, as you progress up the ladder in academia, most faculty experience an increasing burden of administrative responsibilities that takes them away from the things they enjoy. Uh, about being an academic and an academic physician, and that's what I was experiencing. And that led me then to explore other opportunities. And, and one of these was a move to industry, which I must say I, I had not thought of before, but it was just a serendipitous connection to a former colleague that I had tried to recruit, actually as part of my group that had led me down that path. What I found in industry was an ability to get back to science, back to the, the core of what had started all of my interest in medicine to begin with, and I remember asking one of my senior physician uh, mentors one time if he regretted losing that connection, direct connection to patients. And his response was no. In industry, I get to help many more patients than I could ever have done as a physician in practice or in academia. So I, I took that move and pursued that path. It was a great experience. Got an opportunity to uh, lead many groups, still remaining very close to the, the science and, and uh, the research and development phase of things. After you know, several years across two companies in pharma, decided it was uh, time to get again back to the science and move to an academic affiliated nonprofit biotech here in La Jolla, Caliber, working with Pete Schultz, who's a phenomenal scientist, working with Pete to build a translational group and get their first molecules ready for clinical testing. Then I moved down to the uh, R&D head at Regulus, again, an amazing opportunity. 
experience with a public company, which I had always wanted to get, a small biotech public company. And uh, it was in that context that I met up with DA, introduced by a, a mutual friend. And that was an amazing match in terms of our interests and motivation. So a circuitous path through multiple phases of my life here, touching on different aspects of academia and industry, biotech, and now investments. Leading us right into our next question, Tim. DA, I, I would absolutely love to hear, and you touched on this briefly in your intro, but what brought you from tech investing into the biotech space? Maybe I'll make one general comment first, which is that what we think of as quote unquote tech investing is really relative to whatever moment we're in. So, you know, at one point the wheel was technology and then electricity was technology and so forth. And so the background that I have as an investor is basically as a generalist. I'm fascinated by capital allocation problems. How should resources in society be allocated to new concepts that people are pursuing uh, in such a way that we collectively are getting the biggest bang for our buck. So where I began as an investor, obviously was in, in some ways a frivolous area, music and the arts, although I, I don't really feel that way about them, but they certainly are, are a nice to have in your life as opposed to health, which is obviously among the, the most, if not the most fundamental aspect of all of our lives. And so I think what has motivated me into our space over time is a combination of, of three factors, really. One is the shared commitment that Tim and I both have with our time and talents trying to do things that really help people ultimately. The second is also, I think, something Tim and I share, which is that the problems that companies have to solve and that the science of medicine has to solve in health are uh, fascinating problems. And biology is the sort of mother load of complexity and interestingness, uh, if you're a curious person. And then I think the third is that we're in a transformational moment in human history for a number of different areas in the economy. One of them is certainly energy, and you see this sort of revolution around decarbonization. Another appears to be finance, and you maybe see that in what's happening with the cryptocurrencies and, and that whole world. But then the third would certainly be health and the technology of medicine itself. Tim, you can uh, feel free to disagree here, but my view of the history of medicine, if you zoom out, is that what we think of as medicine as a sort of scientific discipline really only began in the past 150 to 200 years. So this whole enterprise is basically a new thing for humans. And if I had to put it in a simplistic way, the, the story is that we're going from a long history as humans of practicing some version of witchcraft. Essentially, we've always gotten sick and died at various times in our lives. And in the past, we used to primarily address this through superstition and trying random things. And where we are in the process of going is towards a true scientific approach to managing human health. And that does in interesting ways actually plug into managing the health of other ecosystems beyond just human organisms. Animal health sees fascinating dividends from the discoveries that we're making. And ultimately, broader systems like ecological systems may, from the same sorts of concepts that people are pursuing in this life sciences revolution. So it's a long answer, but those are really the three drivers of what has pushed me into our space. I think they make it just an enormously exciting area to invest in, build companies in, observe, and benefit from as, as patients or citizens. The three pillars you've defined sound like a phenomenal reason to get involved in biotech. And it really seems like you're bringing your distinct backgrounds together. But I'd love to hear what brought the two of you together to launch Time BioVentures. Well, I mentioned we were introduced by a mutual friend, and I, I had, at the time we met, been looking at a potential next move into the venture world, had been doing some venture diligence work part-time, and it turns out that DA was looking for someone to partner with him to build a firm who had a pharma biotech hardcore science background. 
So I think we complement each other in, in many ways. I have certainly been involved in investing from the pharma biotech perspective, making decisions about which programs to finance or you know, which outside opportunities to consider acquiring or partnering. But I hadn't really developed an insight or a strategy around what makes good investing in the biotech or life science space. And I think DA had been coming at this from the opposite direction, having this sort of uh, sixth sense about what a great and impactful opportunity might look like, but learning, and he's learning amazingly fast, the ropes of basic science to applied science as it relates to healthcare and technology applied to human health. Those two things brought us together. And I think I can still remember our first meeting over lunch, not too far from where I live in Del Mar at, at a restaurant. And we chatted for hours about what each of us saw as, as the future of healthcare, the future of medicine, what the hottest things were in, in the life science biotech spectrum. It was pretty clear that we had a, a great chemistry together, a lot of respect for each other's backgrounds that were very different and opinions, which seemed amazingly aligned and philosophies that were aligned, although we obviously had very different life experiences. So I think that's what led to the agreement that it made sense for us to join forces and, and create Time Bio Ventures. And that leads us perfectly into our next topic around launching a VC fund. Today, there seem to be more investors and investment firms than ever before. And at time, you focus on investing in biotechnology and healthcare startups that seek to reinvent medicine. So as a question to you both, what makes Time BioVentures different? I'll take a stab at it. I think for some of the reasons Tim just alluded to, this is a moment in the landscape of medical innovation where it's a big advantage to be interdisciplinary. And so our team from the outset is quite interdisciplinary. And what I mean by that is you have this moment where solving big problems in, in healthcare requires you to understand areas at the same time that typically have been siloed. So software is now becoming important to everything from the way a hospital runs to drug discovery. Certain basic engineering concepts are now being increasingly invoked in the design of human medicines. We see enormous potential for technologies like soft robotics, artificial intelligence, material sciences innovations to play a role in medicine. And so in the past, I'd think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you were starting a firm to go after big opportunities in healthcare, the core expertise that you needed to have was much more delineated from other investors. And I think what we take advantage of is that between the two of us, we can speak all of these different languages at the same time. And that enables us to understand companies, to understand founders that are really unique to this moment. And then of course, as a function of both Tim's and my backgrounds in different ways, we can bring to little companies uh, a significant amount of experience in managing the sorts of problems that they're gonna need to overcome. And those range from very common company formation problems all the way to deep technical questions that Tim's experience, especially in drug development, gives us a, a great perspective on. Yeah, the other thing I would add to that is that not only do we complement each other in terms of our disciplinary expertise and, and backgrounds, but in our networks, in terms of the established investor networks that DA has been plugged in for quite you know, a number of years, I also bring uh, a number of individuals, experts across a variety of disciplines that allow for supporting the companies, not only from the evaluation perspective, but also in the growth perspective of a company that is just getting launched or at critical junctures of their development. That perspective of interdisciplinarity is one that, as you say, DA, is really thriving in the life sciences today. How do you bring the lessons from your own backgrounds to bear when supporting biotech startups? Yes, it's interesting. Biotech startups are, are quite similar to the experience I would say that I had in academia about starting up new projects that eventually you would seek funding for from a government or non-government agency. 
you know, you start with concepts, you have to go and look at whether there's freedom to operate uh, in a sense and what the competitive space looks like, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel and, and work on something that someone has just published. Having that perspective, I think, offers an opportunity to apply the learnings that I've had in academia and then in industry to support and, and actually, in, in some ways, filter the opportunities that we're seeing. And I find that, number one, very exciting to do as someone with my background. But I also see that working with DA, who has that other side covered very well in terms of the business and entrepreneurial and investment side, as a, a really great mix for us to not only filter opportunities to identify those that are the, the most promising based on our current analysis, but also to guide them into a, a successful outcome. Yeah, the, the other thing I would just say on that front is one of the things I've learned in being a part of about 40 private investments to date is there are all sorts of differences between the companies that grow to a healthy but minimal scale and those that become the most important companies of a generation. And we, at the end of the day, are trying to find those companies. We're looking for entrepreneurs that have the capacity to build something truly transformational. Having watched Spotify and SpaceX and Ripple and a few of these really take off, it's become clear what the attributes are of those founders or of those concepts. And so I think in our space, it's filled with hazards. There are just so many challenging things about building a little drug company or a little diagnostics company. You know, you've got scientific risk, you've got financing risk, you have regulatory risk. It's a minefield. And it takes very, very special people who are not just ambitious and intelligent, but they also have to be really thoughtful and strategic about how they thread the needle because you have to get so many things right. I don't think our space is like software in that respect, you know, where the mantra has become move fast and break things. Our space is one where you, you want to balance creativity with a uh, real rigor and discipline. And so we try to find and nurture that unusual combination in entrepreneurs. Here at Alix, we're strong believers that the university entrepreneurial ecosystem will be crucial in this new wave of biotech that you're both describing. Focusing for a moment, Tim, on the fact that you hold active roles in academia, industry, and venture capital. How do you think about the synergy across these three pillars? I'm a firm believer that academia is the richest source of discovery and innovation. It often is the uh, spark that others need to recognize, capture, kindle, and move forward. And I think this is, to be honest with you, this is something that's not only gonna continue, but may evolve into perhaps an even greater importance for future you know, innovation in biotech and, and healthcare. And part of this is enabled by the fact that in the past, an academic scientist could only take their ideas so far. It is one of the reasons why I left academia. I had some ideas about translating some of my research into products that could be diagnostics or therapeutics, but the hurdle to get ideas translated into something uh, tangible is high. I think that hurdle is dropping. And I think that one of the future transitions will be probably how academic research is funded, which right now it's, it's primarily funded by the NIH in the US. And I think that there may be greater and greater opportunities for both private funding from the, the pharma biotech sector, which interestingly enough was in place many years ago and then lost favor outside of clinical trials. And also the ability of academics to more easily spin out their research and get traction from investors, uh, such as our firm, to uh, see their ideas translated into something that, as DA said, can go big. Biotechs and pharma is really, I think, can assist with the transition because a lot of the technology and resources exist there. But whereas before it was almost a requirement for an academic to partner with the biotech or pharma, now with the uh, availability of contract research organizations to do everything from high throughput screening, you know, chemistry, antibody, protein generation, expression, all the way through to clinical trial support, you really can go uh, quite a ways from an academic idea through to you know, a product. 
Tim, you touched on spinning out research and the improvements that commercialization is seeing in academia. How can university commercialization offices learn from the startup sector? Yeah, I think this is an important topic. And I've actually reflected on it some time now because I'm an advisor to some academic tech transfer offices. One of the challenges, and I had that challenge as an academic, is you don't really know what the other side looks like. The other side being what the, the biotech sector and pharma looks like. And so you're trying to create something that becomes attractive and will gain not only the scientific momentum, but also the resources necessary to move it forward from private investors or VC firms or, or the like. What you know is how to write grants, and that's not a very effective way to get funding for these kinds of spin-outs. You know, one, one of the things that I think universities can learn from is actually bringing in individuals who have been successful in pharma, biotech, and perhaps even previous entrepreneurs who made it out uh, of the university into a successful company, and relying on them to help guide the academic entrepreneurs into what would be the, the appropriate transition, whether it's a license deal or whether it's a true spin out. And most importantly, I would say, is understanding what the package looks like. I call it the package because it's not just a great idea. It's not just IP. It's understanding the, the key elements that makes an opportunity very attractive. And one of the things I did learn over the years in, in, in academia, then through to you know, pharma biotech is that whenever you're dealing with a complex problem that has multiple variables, it's an issue with understanding how do you minimize the variables? Because the success rate is not the addition of the probabilities, it's the multiplication. So if your success rate is dependent upon success across multiple uncertainties, it can be a pretty daunting task to move something forward. Understanding what that package looks like in terms of minimizing variables that will therefore make that opportunity very attractive to investors, to pharma, or to a potential biotech licensing or a startup opportunity, I think is key. I, I would just add to that, and it goes back to what I was saying about the way to build companies in, in our sector is not move fast and break things. It is one of these key factors that entrepreneurs surround themselves with people who are able to tell them what they don't know. And I think it can be dangerous to transpose the lessons of internet entrepreneurship into this field. If you want to go out tomorrow and build an NFT collectibles platform, I'm not sure that there are too many seasoned entrepreneurs who used to work at Microsoft who are going to tell you a lot of valuable things about how to do that. But what is unique, whether you're building a, a product that's going to end up going into our healthcare delivery system or whether you're building a drug company that ultimately will likely sell to a big pharma if it's successful, you're needing to put together that package that Tim described that is able to be incorporated and ingested by these massive existing systems that we have. While I think there's an amazing wave of innovation coming out of these academic environments, I, I am not bullish on the idea that we're going to see a, a wholesale disruption of, say, the global pharma industry by Silicon Valley startups. And I think that's maybe an easy mistake to make today because it, it would be great to see the Sergey Brin and Larry Page of biotech show up tomorrow and put AstraZeneca out of business with their brilliant new model. But as large and old as these big pharma companies are, these are not stupid companies. They are not organizations that are incapable of bringing innovation to the market. I mean, just look at the integral role that they played in getting some of these vaccines in the past couple of years developed. And so they really do represent an infrastructure that entrepreneurship has to plug into in some sense. And it's in terms of where there's room for tech transfer to improve on the model, I think it, it's exactly what Tim said. It, it's bringing in experienced folks who know how to help package basic science in such a way that it can start to move into our healthcare delivery system or into our medical products discovery and development infrastructure. I think you've both 
touched on this topic around how you evaluate companies. And Tim, you mentioned earlier that DA almost has a sixth sense in the space. So I would love to ask you the question directly. How do you evaluate companies, especially in such novel areas where there often is no existing playbook? I'll take a, a, a first stab at that. I would say that there are three key components to our evaluation, and then there are many subcomponents within each one of these. The first pass is that the, the science has to have a hook. It has to be transformational. DA mentioned this before. We're not interested in incremental innovation. We're interested in things that will really be disruptive and transform patients' lives, the healthcare system, the way health and, and, and wellness are evaluated and optimized. The second is the people. And you know, I would say each one of these is almost equally weighted. Although you can have great science and, and if the people involved are not strong in their leadership, if they're not self-aware, if as DA mentioned, they are not aware of what they don't know. And furthermore, if they're not a, a able to bring together others around them that provide information outside of their expertise, then that's a big red flag to us. So. Strong leadership, self-awareness, and the ability to recruit others to their vision is absolutely one of the key elements here. And then the third, I would just call the game plan because it's got many components. It's a research to development plan with key milestones and de-risking aspects to it. It's also a business plan working backward from what does the product look like and is that something that is going to be transformational and that not only investors can get excited about, but will be something that will make a big difference to human life and, and well-being. So those three elements, science, the people, and the game plan, I, I think are the, the, the major elements in my playbook, or especially if it's something that hasn't been explored before. The only thing I'll add to that, and I certainly don't want to take credit for having a sixth sense, whatever Tim says, but there is instinct, right? And like all investors, Tim and I bring to the decision-making process a certain amount of gut feel, both when we initially meet a company, how, how do they make us feel? How excited do we get about that potential? If we get excited, we can assume that other people will in the company's future. And that's a good thing. But on the side of making the investment decision, it's only one factor, this gut feel. And I think there's a huge amount of research into how investment teams make decisions and then the resulting outcomes. And this plugs into a broader literature about decision-making in behavioral psychology. What has been abundantly shown is that process is more important than outcomes in a way. In other words, you can have great investment outcomes as a result of making terrible decisions. <laughs> And you can also have poor outcomes that result from making very good decisions. And what I mean by a good or a bad decision is a decision that is the result of a rigorously adhered to process. What Tim and I have spent a lot of time doing as we've set up our firm is to implement a, a process for diligencing investments that certainly incorporates our gut instinct, but that is really there to keep us from doing dumb things just because we fall in love. And of course we wanna fall in love with any company we're gonna back, but the way that we pair that with a discipline is through a process. And so what you learn over time is that there are certain questions you always need to ask, there's certain information you always need to collect, and you can't skip any steps or take anything for granted. You look at what happened with Theranos, right? And what you see is this amazing cascade of very smart, very wealthy, very experienced investors making a bad decision because they didn't follow a real process. They used a proxy for a process, like is someone else who I think is smart doing it? Since we're managing other people's money, we take that responsibility very seriously. Developing our process, making that process better over time is really one of the core uh, assets of our firm. And that talk of process is a perfect transition into our third topic around navigating the biotech revolution. With the rise of tech bio, the melding of technology and biology, among other disciplines, 
the life science sector is experiencing unprecedented and accelerating innovation. And there's claims that biology is now driving the fourth industrial revolution. Dia, I loved what you said earlier about threading the needle and balancing both creativity with rigor and discipline, even as it sounds like you're trying to do at time. Can you share your thoughts on the intersection of biological engineering and design? Are there artistic principles we can draw on to both enable and enhance biotech innovation today? I think the first thing I would suggest is that this tech bio junction may be a little bit um, oversold or maybe misframed. And what I mean by this is there, there's a great book. I don't know if you guys have read it years ago. I think Robert Carlson wrote it called biology is technology. And I, I go back to my earlier point about what we consider technology is really a cultural question. It, in a certain sense, it's anything new or anything that enhances productivity. And what we have right now is this wonderful proliferation of new tools. But again, in thinking about this relatively recent history of medicine, a couple hundred years, it's been a pretty rich history of new tools showing up from antibiotics and germ theory to the first small molecules to the first biologics. The innovations have kept coming at a pretty impressive pace since medicine truly got started. And so I do think we're in an exciting moment, but I think that moment is just a continuation of what's already been going on. And in thinking about how it invokes design or other, I guess, epistemological concepts from other areas. To me, the question is always how you combine creativity with discipline. So creativity is sort of this unbounded, unstructured way of thinking, connecting ideas that haven't been connected before searching through spaces that haven't been explored. And it's obviously integral to doing new things. But then once you have a great idea, it becomes sort of an engineering problem. How do you actually reduce it to practice? And I think when Tim talked about that third pillar of what we look for in companies, it is this ability to rigorously specify the process that one is going to take. And again, it's mirrored in the investing approach. You know, we cast a pretty wide net. We talk to a lot of people. We read a lot of interesting stuff. And that's this sort of stew that you hope is going to throw off interesting ways of thinking, interesting new ideas. But once you have those, then you have to plug it into a real process. And so I think today what we are, are looking for are people who both have this kind of big picture conceptual strength, but then also know how to be practical. And what you see with the greatest companies in history is that they move in a stepwise way towards the big picture. You know, I mean, take Amazon or something like this, right? Starts, he's, he's just selling you books and he nailed that and proved that they could do something in a completely original way there. And that became the stepping stone to so many other businesses. You can look at the history of other conglomerates like in the chemicals industry or Coke industries or some of these massive empires that built over time. And they tend to have that kind of organic history to them. They don't start out as this boil the ocean endeavor. They, they start off as something quite practical and then are really good at exploring. How will pharmaceutical companies, speaking of larger scale industry, play a role in driving technology and biotechnology? Will they need to change from how they practice today to keep pace with the rate of innovation? I think the answer is yes. We've gone through a couple of phases here. If I think back when I was in academia, it was not uncommon to have uh, very strong pharma university relationships. In fact, I remember being a visiting professor at a number of universities and seeing plaques on uh, the walls of laboratories saying that this is a blank pharma supported laboratory. It got a bit of a, I would say, a negative bent to it or feeling about it. And so I think that there was a tendency to move away from that kind of support and funding. But I actually think that is a direction that is open now for the future to get 
pharmaceutical companies thinking about earlier interactions with innovation-driven uh, scientists. The fact is that the bulk of the discoveries are being generated in academia. And most academic scientists often lack the insight into the application of their discovery. Some rare entrepreneurial spirits uh, who happen to have academic credentials and happen to make the discovery do have the insight or have that spark, as I mentioned previously, about how to surround themselves with people that can nurture that all the way through to a successful spin out or maybe beyond that even. But most of them sit there with their discoveries, present them at meetings and publish eventually on their discoveries without knowing whether this is going to lead to anything more than perhaps a patent at the university. If we could think about a future where pharmas actually create, and I don't know which direction this is going to have to come from, but perhaps universities can take the first step here, but create settings where science is presented to a forum where multiple pharmas can participate, small biotechs, big biotechs, pharmas, in roundtable discussions about hot science under CDA, work that's perhaps under peer review for, for being published or patents already filed, and in an attempt to match the innovation in the university with the, the interest of the pharmas and to see where it fits with their corporate strategy and, and future directions in R&D. I think this is one area that is ripe for future collaboration that can start very early in the process. The other thing that pharmas can do is just being more transparent about what their corporate strategy is. Every, every company has it. It's not by chance that they go in a certain therapeutic direction or abandon others. But many times you don't find out about that until pretty late when it's a public disclosure about people being laid off. That strategy shift didn't happen at that time. It happened oftentimes a year before. And then I guess the third would be, as, as I mentioned, this concept of investments and early partnerships with academic scientists to gain access to the early discoveries, perhaps facilitated by these fora or roundtables where these discoveries are presented to them. I think that could accelerate the pace of translation from discovery to therapeutic, diagnostic, or other applications. One final question to you both here. What, in your opinion, is the future of biotech? And as we move towards that future, how do you think about navigating the biotech revolution of today? I, I see no limit to the, the potential for biotech. It, it's just booming. As DA mentioned earlier, you, you can look back at the history of modern medicine and see some of the early milestones, key milestones, about 150 years ago. And if you look at the tech overlap with biology revolution, that's not even you know, three decades old and, and fueled by the full sequencing of the human genome, which some people say, well, you know, so it's been sequenced and why haven't we, you know, seen amazing things come out of it? We are, it just took a while because having the first sequence is only like having a draft. You need multiple drafts to understand uh, the complexity of it and, and the variables. And then beyond the sequence, uh, you've got the epigenetic aspects and polymorphisms to understand. So I think there, there's no real limit to the increase of the application of basic research to life sciences innovation for the foreseeable future. And I think this is just going to yield uh, greater and greater. It's going to fuel the, the whole system. Biotech has the potential, if not already, to overtake tech in terms of its, its, its success and its uh, impact on uh, daily life. Yeah, I'll just add to that. They're not new ideas, but just because they're not new ideas doesn't mean that they've already happened. And, and these are specifically the concepts of preventative medicine and of personalized medicine. But we're still at the dawn of both of those ideas actually being put into practice and productized in medicine. We have, particularly in the United States, but also in other industrialized rich economies, built in the past 50 to 100 years enormous healthcare infrastructure. And much of that infrastructure is oriented around taking care of people who are very sick. And I think this concept of uh, attempting to prevent disease in the first place, or at the very least catch it early and minimize the downstream treatment that is required is the direction that we're going. 
And then the overlay of personalization is, of course, to do that in a way that respects each individual and the uniqueness of them and of their disease. And so both of those ideas that people have been talking about for 20 or 30 years still can serve as a North Star for entrepreneurs or investors. While the biotech industry and the healthcare delivery system do overlap in significant ways, in, in a certain sense, they are sort of zero sum. Because if you can imagine a future where no one gets sick, then we wouldn't need much of a healthcare system. And so what I hope over time is that we see the true scientific discipline of medicine start to overtake the kind of witchcraft division of it. And what I could imagine years in the future, you're seeing it with COVID, which has been just this amazing accelerant. People want care at their home if they can get it. They want healthcare to feel like every other part of the modern consumer economy. And medicine is obviously sacrosanct in certain ways. It is different than Starbucks, but there is just a huge amount of improvement that we already know we need to make as a society. And all it takes to get us there is a lot of creativity and hard work on the part of entrepreneurs. And before we come to a closing here, folks, a few rapid fire questions to cap things off. Would love, now that we've talked about where we're heading in life sciences, to talk about the, the challenges uh, ahead for us. What would you describe, Tim, as the grand challenges of life sciences facing us over the next 30 years? Yeah, I think three main challenges come to mind. The first, is, as DA was alluding to, is the adaptation to changes in societal and government frameworks uh, that will be constantly evolving. I, I think the life science sector is going to have to be thinking 10 to 15 years ahead because that's the, the cycle time from idea to translate to uh, a product in, in many of the uh, life science areas. It, it's very different than tech and coming up with a new software product. And of course, the timelines may be reducing as well. So understanding how to anticipate changes is the first one. The second is, and I would say it's both a challenge and an opportunity, and that is that there's going to be an expectation for greater healthcare equality. And this is going to be driving the need for cost-effective solutions. And the third one, which is a corollary to that, is there are going to be pressures on pricing of drugs, diagnostics, medical devices, healthcare in general. And this is going to drive solutions that are innovative. And right, right now, we, we're not even uh, thinking about them. This is something that life science is going to have to be focused on. Where does that next change that is going to be transformational for health and wellness? As DA said, if you don't need a drug for a particular disease because you've been able to prevent it by lifestyle change, microbiome change, or some other early prophylactic or preventive treatment, that's going to be transformational. Uh, and D, now that Tim's described biotech 30 years from now, if we flash forward maybe to that vision, can you share with us what does biotech look like in 2050? Wow. Well, um, yeah, I'll go real pie in the sky here. Basically, th my, my claim would be that there will be some moment in the future where we have a ability to represent and, and model living systems in computers. And this has begun already. We've made some early progress. Tim was on the board of a great company called Schrodinger that pioneered physics-based simulation of uh, molecular interactions. So that's simulating some very small things in biology. There's work that's been done by Marcus Covert and others. Um, he's at Stanford on simulating very simple, uh, relatively speaking, prokaryotic cells and building whole cell computational models. Uh, amazing digital clockwork being done there. And we have a, a lot of work ahead of us if we want to get there with eukaryotes and then ultimately with more complex organisms, ultimately getting to something as hard to simulate as a human. So we do from time to time see companies that claim they've already done this. We don't believe them, but I'm still rooting for it. I think that is the sort of progress that we might be able to make in the next 30 to 50 years. Hard to say when we'll get there because we need to make a lot of progress on the experimental side to even generate the data that would inform the construction of those sorts of models. But 
if you look at the whole sector, what is most expensive and time consuming is that the only way we can really find out whether things work today is to try them in people. And the, the singularity for biotech, in my view, will be when that can be done in a computer at uh, the zero incremental costs that we're used to with software. We're a long way from that, but that'll be a watershed moment in human history that I hope I get to see. Fantastic. Love that vision for the future and excited to be a part of that. As we wrap up on this episode here, folks, any closing thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? Perhaps maybe how can they learn about the work you're doing? We've touched on some fun, exciting projects and spaces and time bio venture. How can our audience learn about your work and any closing thoughts you'd like to share? Sure. Well, we have a website at www.timebioventures.com. And if you go there, we, we try to update the website every time we make an investment. We're getting better at that. But that's really uh, what we're proudest of are these companies that we've started to invest in over the past year. And there will be more to come. So we invite your audience to check out the website, get in touch if anyone listening is in the process of building companies or if you're an investor and you're looking for other like-minded folks to work with, we welcome it. Wonderful. Thank you both, DA and Tim, for an absolutely fantastic episode. I'm sure our listeners will be craving for more here. We're very 